Hello everyone, welcome to the session, The Art of Preschool. Thanks for coming along today. Um, my name is Michelle Jones, I'm from Brilliant Casting, and I just wanted to say before we start, thank you um, to our sponsors of this session who are Boom Kids. Um, a huge great big thank you to them. The CMC depends on the support of numerous sponsors uh, to create such a brilliant conference as this. So we are particularly grateful to Boom Kids for their support. So thank you very much. So today we're going to be talking about preschool. We've got some tips for you of things that work and maybe don't work quite so well. And we've got two veterans. We've got Lindsay O'Callaghan from um, Nickelodeon and we've got Andy Mundy Castle from Doc Hearts. So without further ado, I'll hand over to you. It's going to be a very inclusive session. So please relax and enjoy and join in whenever you want to. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I suppose I'll, I'll introduce myself first. Then you'll do that, and uh, and we've we had a chat before this session, and thought the best way around this is that we will be conversing with each other and asking questions that uh, pertain to the things that we're going to be sharing. I suppose, which felt like a, a nice natural course of action. Thank you, Michelle. Um, so I, I'm Andy Mundy Castle, the founder of Doc Hearts. Uh, we've been running for five years now. Um, a slight untraditional uh, entry into children's. Um, children's content actually because the company was built on the basis of making documentaries and non-fiction work um, and so we, we, we've we been producing for everyone on long form more adult like content and three years ago the, the, the impending birth of my daughter sort of shifted my attention towards children's content and I started looking at what was out there um, that could help her see herself and, and um, you know kind of look at con looking at stuff that was was there for her there was a very sort of lack there was a lack of lack of things that reflected what i thought would be the kind of things that i'd encourage her to watch as she as she as she grew of age so it was a very uh, considered decision to uh, diversify the company's attention towards uh, children's content and that all started at this conference really i heard that this was the place place to be so it's the first place that i came to to kind of learn about children's content uh, so when you say I'm a veteran, I am still a, I still see myself as a baby actually in this industry, but I'm glad and appreciative of how far we've come within this space in a short space of time. Um, but it was at the uh, children's media conference that I gathered uh, a lot of information without real prior contacts in this uh, industry. In this side of the industry, it, it was told to me that this is where you go. So this is where I came to, and it has been a mecca, you know, for for that duration of time. Uh, fortunately, at a skills builder, I, I met a wonderful person, Louise Bucknell, who, who really d told us what they were looking for and um, it helped me sort of shift the ideas that we had in this space um, and, and really kind of hone in, hone in on the ideas that we wanted to tell. Uh, and fortunately, a few development sessions later, we, we landed, uh, we landed a, a series, the Go Green with the Grimwades, which went on, for a, went, went on for a couple of seasons, and we are now looking at a, a new iteration of what that looks like. Um, but yeah, I mean, to go back to me, Andy Mundy Castle, documentary producer for the last 15 years, and um, a newbie in children's content. But I'm really glad to be here with so many lovely faces. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hi everyone, thanks for coming today. We weren't expecting it to be this busy, so <laughs> there are no freebies, just to be clear. And that's <laughs> yes, that's um, so I've been at Nickelodeon for 16 years now. Um, anyone in the room that's kind of thinking of moving into TV, my route perhaps wasn't um, the most straightforward. I did a multimedia journalism degree at Bournemouth Uni, which is a university that a lot of people in the industry um, went to, including my colleague Chris Rose, who I work with, the Blue Zoo Boys, um, Zia from Warner Media. Um, and I did a journalism degree because it covered print, um, radio and TV, and I thought that would give me the best chance of getting a job when I left. As part of that degree, you had to do work experience at places over the summer for free, and I did. And one of the places I did was at um, Ginger Media, back then owned by Chris Evans. And mm. one of my jobs was replying to all these begging letters that he got when he sold it for um, 75 million to the Scottish Media Group. Wow. Yeah, I got through quite a few letters. <laughs> and so in my last year at uni, I was actually offered a job as his second PA. Amazing, brilliant, coming out of uni for a job. He then ran off with Billy Piper. <laughs> and I was like, oh, God. Um, so I got offered a job as a runner. 
and a receptionist and the person who died in the stationery cupboard and all manner of things. And without Chris there, it became very clear that commissions weren't being picked up because people were buying into Chris, not the Scottish media group, surprisingly enough. Um, so I left there and ended up at the BBC in a place called Rapic, where I filed contracts for six months to get my foot in the door. Um, and from there, a job came up in what used to be our um, aerial magazine in children's acquisitions. And I went for an interview with the lovely Estelle Hughes, who's now at Sky Kids. And um, I went home and cried because the HR person was so horrible and thought, I've never got it and I really want to work in children's. And, all. and then I got called by Estelle, who then told me that, oh, they never listen to HR. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I was really, really upset. I said to my mum, oh, I'm never going to get a job. And I did. And my job was looking after things like the Teletubbies and Tweenies and scheduling them. On my wedding day, there was wedding episodes that went out of both. <laughs> All those kinds of perks of the job. Um, you know, helped Chris with things like Postman Pat, um, compliance editing, you know, if you put a red cross on that first aid box, we were blurring it out, um, and all manner of fun things like that. I was at the Beeb for five years. They announced the move to Manchester. All my family and my then husband were based in London, and so I knew I wasn't going to be leaving all of that to come up here, as lovely as it is in the north. Um, and the job from Nickelodeon just landed in my inbox on a thing called Grapevine. I have no idea if it even does it still I, exist. I remember Grapevine. Yeah. yeah. And I thought, oh, I'll go along. And I met Layla Lewis at my interview. And I was like, oh, this is a lovely place to work. And they're really nice. And I got offered the job 16 years ago. Um, and from then on, I've been lucky enough to progress through the Nickelodeon family. I was working exclusively for the UK. Now I'm international. Um, I work very closely with the Milkshake team over there. Hello. Love you guys. <laughs> um, and I acquire with Louise the content for the UK. I also work on the enhanced acquisitions. Um, things like the Adventures of Paddington are my work babies. Um, and I also review pitches, a lot of pitches. Oh, so many pitches. Um, we had over 500 last year. Um, so getting through all of those from lots of people in this room. <laughs> I know I owe notes. Um, it, so it's a very full-on, busy, wonderful job, though, and I wouldn't want to work anywhere else. I'm lucky to work with a really amazing, supportive team. I've had both my children at Nickelodeon. You know, I've been able to work flexibly, which has been really, really amazing. Um, and I get to come to places like this and meet wonderful people. I do genuinely think we're all so lucky to work in such a lovely, um, you know, embraceive, supportive industry. Mm. That's me. Amazing. Um, so we've introduced ourselves. That ruled off the first question. Yeah, um, but I, I'm going to go straight for the juggler and off script because I'm thinking about a question that if I was sitting on that side, what would I ask you? And you just said 500 pitches. What, what makes the one stand out or the three stand out that for you um, really kind of just shift the dial when you're thinking about everything that you have to think about in your position? So I'm now going to shift my answer into that. Too. Yes. <laughs> Um, I would say the ones that have really thought about their target audience and have thought about what those at home want to watch, what they find funny, what's important to them, what's reflected of them, what truly reflects with my international hat on, not just kids in the UK globally. Um, there are things that will connect all of them. We do an enormous amount of research at Nickelodeon with groups of children. Things like family are universal. That is still the most important thing to children wherever they are um, so it, it's things like that it's people that have done their homework they're not pitching a show that we already have um, you know a family of pigs we're good thanks <laughs> Sing, singing mermaids under the water again those bubble guppies fulfill my needs um, it, it's that kind of thing also as well it's full of heart um, and you can tell you want to know about those characters those characters they've got you would want to have around your house for a play date because they're going to you know, be the ones you want your children to hang out with, the ones that are going to be their friends on the screen um, and representative of the kids in the playground, whether that be from um, a diversity point of view for me. Um, they reflect different personalities, they reflect different ethnicities, they reflect different religions, all those kinds of things um, are truly what we're, we're looking for and those are the ones that stand out and don't, are doing it from a really organic, authentic point of view, not just ticking a box. Mm. We get a lot of shows, and you'll have the lineup, and you can tell somebody has looked at it and gone, we've ticked every single box, and not one of those boxes actually feel like it's there as a purpose to 
tell real stories. It's there just to kind of say, yes, we've done that, we've got that. And that isn't what Nickelodeon is about. It's authentic. Yeah. And that's what good pitches are. Mm. Before you jump into a question, I just want to add something. In terms of the practical material, yep. like when somebody's coming to you with an idea or your team, uh, what what would you say are the kind of tick boxes on that side of thing? You know, a pitch document, a treatment, yep. tape. What what helps that? I would say once process. you've got a relationship with us or any other broadcaster or other platform, it is really speak to them early doors because Chris has an immense development slate. So you might be having the most best idea ever, and he's already got very something similar mm -hmm. there. So have those. Re we are thinking about a show about X. Is it of interest? Literally just that initial conversation or that quick email, and you can say yes or no. From that, if it is a yes, then it's time to go away and really think about the stories you want to tell and the characters you need to develop to tell them. Um, again, who your target is. Preschool is often just kind of said as a, that's the genre. But within preschool, it's very fragmented in terms of what appeals to a two-year-old is not necessarily going to appeal to a, a six-year-old. How are you going to capture as many of them? Do you not want to capture all of them? That's fine too. It's really fine to make your idea more niche and be in the lower or the upper end um, you know, are, is your, do you want your show to be the baton that is passing into the older animation space? Cool. You got one for me. Yeah. Yes, Andy. <laughs> Sorry, I did go off script there just because uh, she started on. I don't know where I am now, Andy. You're totally winging it. Um, why do you love preschool, Andy? Um, I, as a producer, I think it's the most kind of. It's the most fertile ground to really get a real-time reaction from your audience. You know, I think that, it, and when I say that, I think that, you know, you, the wonder of preschool takes kids into a world that you can see they're just so captivated, whereas as adults, we are, you know, you're watching things by social media or you're kind of consuming it in, in the periphery. And I think that one of the things that has really kind of skewed my perspective with, with, with my admiration for preschool and, and the kind of why I want to enhance the business in that 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 dimension is that you know it's uh you you really get that that you have the ability to really introduce young, those young minds to things that can really shape their thinking about the world and i think that that's just a really beautiful quality of this part of the industry you know that it's uh, it's it's kind of believing in those those youngest audiences and the power they have to respond to good solid content that kind of you know can start those seeds you know as a as a parent you kind of um you know how difficult it is to just pass on instructions or kind of get things to land and and the fact that you have content that potentially helps you do that, be it Peppa Pig, be it, you know, Moomin Valley or what have you, that kind of just ways in which engaging their minds creatively, I think is just a real fascinating aspect of content creation, you know, for that, that very sort of fertile mind. And in terms of that content creation, what made you go down the live action route more than anything else for you? So live action for us was just, it was a natural, um, natural progression because it, it complements what we do already. I could you look, look at the systems that we had in place within the business and diversify those without too much stress. You know, going into animation, it, you know, would have been, or it would have been a whole different skill set which we'd have to incorporate into the business, which adds time, adds workforce, and, you know, kind of just a, a real sort of... Um, you know, a, a real sort of different approach to what we're doing already. Uh, I knew that with live action, it's for us, there are those sort of tenets of factual non-fiction storytelling that you can bring to just a younger, different audience and just skew your stories, skew your, your kind of approach to the audience in a way that was still using what we knew in non-fiction for adults, but um, kind of just, yeah, manoeuvring to, to make it work for a younger audience. Um, so that was kind of really, you know, one why I loved it and why, why I think that it was the best fit for us, really. I think, it, you know, things like casting real people, you know, those, that's what we do anyway. And we'll be in touch with you, brilliant <laughs> casting. Uh, you know, just casting real people, casting, you know, kind of for stories, uh, researching st stories, live action, especially, uh, you know, factual live action, just non-fiction live action, sorry, just kind of... just. Felt it was at home with our ethos, basically, yeah. and and that just felt like the absolute right time for us to to, to jump on it. Uh, to you, uh, what tips would you give to those in the audience who already have ideas for preschool uh, for a preschool audience and might be working on an idea or a pitch, 
but they've never worked in this genre before. What, what, what would be your kind of, for people who are coming in at real entry level, what would be your... I'd say the biggest thing is do know your target audience, spend time with them, not just your children. You get so many people coming and go, oh, my child loves this. It's like, mm. that's great. <laughs> but, you know, if you can volunteer at groups like brownies and rainbows or spend time in preschool or read with children and just find out about what makes them tick. Um, another good way to know what's working is to look what channels and platforms are playing. Um, if something's got a return in series, that usually means it's working for them. And so think about why is that working for them? Is it because, you know, it's telling really funny stories? Is it because it's something they can relate to, you know, like Jojo and Grand Grand with the grandparent angle, which is so important? Um, why, why is it working? What is it? As well, take a walk down the toy aisle. Things don't get toys made unless they're doing well. Hmm. Um, because audiences watching at home or on a streamer want their children to interact with those toys. So if you have a look on, you know, Amazon or walk down the toy art in Tesco's or Hamley's, there are other stores available, <laughs> um, then you will know what is working and what isn't from, from the volume of toys. You, yeah. um, there, are, there are many dogs and pigs on those aisles, <laughs> um, so that's a good indication. Also, think about the durations you want to play with. Um, within the preschool genre, we tend to, from a um, our ch channel perspective and, and brands, is we look at either five, seven, or eleven. They're very different stories that you can tell within those um, durations, and you need to think about what duration you want your stories to land in. A five minute is a very brief, you know, you're there, there's a point, you finish it, it's great. Seven, you can go into a little bit more detail. If you're thinking of 11, you're going to have to have a layered narrative with a B plot, and it's a lot more complicated um, to fill that time and it not drag. Um, attention spans for children as well are, you know, decreasing. We're seeing from different um, things with data we're, that's being fed back. So, again, keep that in mind. Um, I remember when I joined Nickelodeon, we had loads of 22-minute shows now. If someone mm. came in with a 22-minute preschool, I'd be like... Ooh, I'm not sure. Um, uh, obviously, specials are great, um, and you can totally market and schedule those accordingly, but it's a very different market. I also think, are you thinking about a co-viewing potential? Preschool is still one of those genres where co-viewing is hugely important. Mm -hmm. You don't want to create a show that makes people want to turn off because, you know, whether the characters are being cheeky to the point of you're like, oh, my goodness, or they're just really irritating. Mm -hmm. Even we've had people, story writers pitch ideas about an annoying noise, and you're like, OK, <laughs> but that child playing the violin for the whole episode is going to really not be something you want to watch. Um, so maybe we might have to reposition that kind of thing. Um, I'd also think about once you've nailed the stories and the durations, think about the, the characters and define them. They need to have clear voices. Um, if lines could sit with other characters and you could swap them in and out, are they really working? Have you really thought them through? Um, a great situation we always say to people is there's a swimming pool. Think about what each of your characters is going to do around that swimming pool. Who's going to cannon pull? Who's going to just dip their toe in to see if it's too cold? Who's on the sun lounger catching rays? Who's getting the um, mock towels in? Um, I think in an older space, if you think of friends, mm. you would be able to say that in terms of those characters, and that's when you know you've nailed defining characters. Um, are you, can all the characters at home... Would all of them, you think different children would pick who their favourite was? Because, again, you want to have that ability within the narrative to play with the characters. Um, writers, sometimes you will find that there's one character they always want to write for. That shouldn't be the case. They should all want to write for all of the characters because they all offer something different and different stories to tell. Um, so that's something I would really say, spend time with your characters. Ways to help define them, like simple things, are things like catchphrases. Um, that also helps if you do have, and you know, let's not deny it, everybody has the ambition at some point in preschool of CP potential. Things like catchphrases and well-defined characters, again, serve, serve that um, very effectively. Um, and also think about the secondary cast as well. Um, as we said, as I said earlier, family is really important. Do you want families 
are all the kids within it going to have families? What types of families are they? You don't want just to have one type of typical, you know, two parents, two kids. But equally, they do exist. And I think often mm. some people go so far down of trying to represent different, you know, single parents, families, blended families. Typical families still exist and it's okay to have them as long as you're thinking as your slate as a whole, from a broadcast point of view, that we are servicing everybody across different series. And I think that's something important to look at of what else, what would you see your inner out being in terms of a schedule or on a platform if you like this you'll also like that what do you see your series sitting alongside what are you aspiring to fantastic um so we've had a lot of talk in different sessions about live action in preschool Mm -hmm. how do you see it evolving from the experience you've had so far um it's it's interesting i suppose again i you know talking from my own experience and i i think as the 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 non-fiction live um you know, live action that we specify on, which is kind of leaning towards documentaries and showing, you know, kind of showing children the wonders of the real world. Um, I think it is more of a move towards a a kind of sustainability and a sense of self and, you know, kind of how do we engage with children at that very early age to think about being more mindful and you know think about kind of things that are actually going to practically help them develop as the world changes you know because we are we are in an ever-changing world in which so many things about identity and uh you know yourself are being questioned on a daily basis and i think if we can um have a point of inclusion of that right at you know that that that, that that early stage I think for me uh, that's what I'd love to see a shift in you know in in live action because I think so much of it whilst it of course it needs to be edutainment it needs to be kind of fun and aspirational um, I still think we as content creators have a duty to kind of now where things are just so challenging you know just things are you know in a state of flux globally I think that you know live action has a duty one to be fun entertain but also kind of just start those seedlings of, you know, uh, what they are going to go on and face as they get older, because we are getting older very young. Mm -hmm. You know, we're getting so much older, younger. Um, uh, I hope that makes sense. Uh, But, you know, it's kind of, I think that I'd love to see a a shift into more thoughtful content that isn't just there for for random, crazy entertainment. Yeah. You know, Um, I do want to ask you something about, because one of the challenges we've, Based in live uh, live action and distributing the show beyond its original broadcast is that you know we, we're, we're dealing with a our show was specific, specifically dealing with a British family. Yeah. Um, taking that to market internationally is very hard, and so you know you you just spoke about when you are thinking about selling a product mm-hmm. uh, an IP globally and I, I you know I, when you're making your decisions about how you expand a precinct beyond this territory what thoughts go into that and you know how do we make something uh, a bit of content a bit more global reaching if for for those people out here that might have something that pertains to that well i think it's kind of celebrating um your show if it is quintessentially british like paddington for example is and really thinking about looking at it as an opportunity for a window on the uk or wherever it is and whoever's marketing it when they are selling it to people needs to kind of promote that as as the bonus of this is a window in the world of or this is still relevant to people because of the you know the positive messaging these characters are still relevant because live action is obviously a little bit trickier because the dubbing isn't so neat yeah um and it can be particularly dis- distracting to to preschoolers but having said that there is obviously lots of you know blues clues for example we we play um globally which mixes animation and live action it's also just telling the stories um with with that in mind and it's simple things that if you are going for it, we have with the American audience, if we're going to say football, they'll be expecting it to be American football. So we will have a visual of a UK football or being kicked into a goal or something just to support it. It's little things like that. If it's if we're, they're eating chips, we'll try and put it with fish and chips, which is no more because otherwise chips, they're thinking of just a packet of Walker's um, type or Lay's as they are in America. It's little things like that. Whereas if you are going to be very... British in the phrasing, like one of my first jobs that I did at Nick um, and I did at the BBC as well was localising scripts 
and taking out... Back in the day, it was even cookies we used to change to biscuits. <laughs> Diapers to nappies, strollers to buggies, all those kinds of things, which I think is a lot less now. I remember always changing Orson to Brilliant, and I wouldn't now. Um, but it, it, Tony, Tony knows this because Tony used to do the localization back in the day at the BBC. But it is, it's thinking about those things. Some things will travel, some things won't. Um, Wordplay as well, totally avoid it if you're going to try for something global because, as funny as like jam and marmalade are to a British person, then jelly in the US and elsewhere, it's all just dubbed to different, in different ways. So that's something else that we just try and avoid. We'd be like, it's a really funny gag, but it's not going to dub, so let's just, just lose it. Mm-hmm. Um, real voices, even when they are dubbed as well, I think the key is when you produce things, is creating a really strong dubbing Bible. Mm-hmm. So the characters that you cast in your show, although they might be voiced by different people in different places, they still really, really nail what you wanted them to portray. So I, I did go off script. But I as, again, again, you sorry. Doing this to me. It's because I, I am, in, I am, I'm too. intrigued as a, as a, as a producer. <laughs> um, but so we talked a lot about development and sort of when the, the initial stages of an idea. So let's just fast track that. You've, uh, you know, a producer's come in, you like their idea, they've done their research on audience, they've uh, got a full Bible on their characters, know their stories, know the world, everything that you said is important for development. Pitches in, meeting with you, what happens next? What's your process when internally, how do you kind of, um, how do you process all of that great material that now that those 500 ideas have gone down to five? So the biggest thing is when you do get a pitch with people, if we do, you send in your idea, we like it, and you're coming in to formally pitch it, is think about who you're pitching to. I have had people put up their PowerPoints, and it's had <laughs> CBB still in the corner. Oh, no. Like, Come on. <laughs> Awkward. Um, uh, so just, just know that. I think I've done that one. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't to me, so you No, right. it wasn't <laughs> Um, know what's working for them currently. I would also say if you have a fear that your show is similar to something from a visual point of view or maybe it's a building show and you want to say that it's totally different to Bob the Builder, call that out at the very start. There is nothing worse than sitting for a pitch and you're thinking the whole way through, this is just like Paw Patrol, this is just like Paw Patrol. (laughs) Say it at the start, this isn't Paw Patrol because this isn't Bob the Builder because call it out at the very top so you've then got them back in the room Mm -hmm. because otherwise you you do check out, you get pitched so much. Think about where the content sits as well, Um, in the linear, the streaming, the AVOD space. Do you want it to sit on all of them? Do you think it should sit on all of them? At the moment, obviously, we rolled out P+, um, Paramount+, Plus two weeks ago. If you haven't got your subscription yet, please do. (laughs) Um, And we are now, as a company, working out what our rollout strategy is, where things should play, if they should play on both of them, when, where they should launch, etc. It's all those kinds of things. You thinking about those things, and if it could play as equally well on linear in the as in the streaming space, that's a really important thing. Um, you also sometimes need to really spoon feed why your idea is right for them. Why is it only them and not someone else? If a show could sit on any platform, it's probably not for Nick. Um, lots of our shows just feel so um, full of heart we used to say heart smart fart which we're not allowed to say anymore so please don't Um, but that is (laughs) we're currently toying with ABC authentic brainy Um, yeah so we're it's it's going for a flux a state of flux so um, but that is if your show doesn't service those old terms which will be new by next year so please come along then um, it's not Nick um you think about what series are currently airing and like I said previously, think about what would go in and out. If you're pitching to Milkshake, please don't bring your bedtime shows. They're a morning block. Mm. And again, we have had people pitch bedtime shows mm. and it's really awkward because you're like, oh, goodness. Um, <laughs> what are their brand values as well? Um, I know some streamers who might be regretting that given current decisions don't have brands. We do. It's something we're proud of. Um, and if you are pitching to someone who has a specific brand, call out why your show is right for their brand. Um, is it the right tone and attitude? I'd also say the biggest thing is you as people. Um, You'll know from the development process, you need to get on, you need to be able to find a happy ground. If at the end of the pitch we give you feedback and you give give us a look and like, well, no, (laughs) 
you know it's going to be a really tricky process making that show for TV. So you've got to be immersive and approachable. And even if you don't agree with things, in the room say yes and then go away and think about how you can meet. My favourite people to work with are people that say, no, but... Mm. And because you know they're still being true to their creative brand, but they're happy to work with you as well. We've all worked on so many series. Sometimes our comment, comments will come because we're working on something else at the same time. And what they're doing is then going to sail it closer to that. So please don't feel like we're, saying, we're giving you feedback because we don't like the idea. It's often there to help you mm. move forward. Mm. As broadcasters, we are often the champions internally for your content. We pitch up to Eric, who you will have seen... Um, in the put your money where your um, mouth is show, we have to sell your show idea onto our internal stakeholders. So we want to want to work with you. We want to love your idea as much as you do. Often people will come in and pitch to us and we will then do a, a very simple back and forth to get your content in the best shape it, it can be to then help sell it on internally. We're, we're kind of the gatekeepers for getting it further up the, the chain, the internal chain. Um, so it's really important that you are the person that we want to work with you. If you can't explain your pitch in a sentence, have a think again, because you should be able to give the real top line of your idea in a sentence. Um, also, always start your pitch with the basics of what duration, what um, medium, live action, animation, um, how many eps you kind of see it sitting in. Um, we are all kind of stuck at the moment still in a 26, 52 type process. Think outside the box. Say, I'd like to make 52 episodes, but two of those episodes are actually going to be short form that you could then see on YouTube and things like that. We are looking to be innovative and, and play with the, the, you know, the rule book is, is slowly but surely being amended, tipexed out, etc. We We are happy to think about new ideas and new ways. Um... See, I'm, I'm, I don't want to repeat stuff where you phone me off. No, no, no. <laughs> I mean, I was going to say, we've got about five more minutes because we do want to have questions, questions from the... Okay. So if there's anything Sorry. that you haven't covered that yes, you would I'm like going to, to cover... I'm going to give you some questions. Oh, no. yes, right. do. You're sure? I was enjoying just asking you. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're getting a lot more I, I from that. You're coming prime you were like, no, let's not practice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to throw you. You didn't warn me about him. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what were the biggest challenges of working in your um, genre with a family of seven and what did you have to kind of put in place in production to, to make it all work and come mm. together as it did? Well, so for those of you that don't know, Go Green with the Grim Waves was based on a social influence of family who um, predominantly make their world and living off of YouTube, uh, homeschool kids. And uh, the show basically took them through... Each episode would look at a different way of uh, engaging them with a greener concept, a kind of more sustainable, eco-friendly uh, approach to the planet. Uh, and we'd have, uh, you know, kind of a, a setup of the problem. We'd see them resolve the problem, and it was a happy green world, green family at the end of it all. Um, uh, and so the challenges that we face, I suppose, is the main thing is that you're working with a family who are used to doing absolutely anything they want to do online. Uh, within within a within a parameter within a remit, uh, and so kind of um, aligning that sort of OK Corral Wild Wild West mentality of YouTube to the, um, the the parameters and the confines of what we know as regulated standards within broadcasting was the biggest challenge, you know, because it was. For, for, I would go to the broadcaster and say, this has happened, <laughs> how do we deal with it? <laughs> you know, and then you go to the family and they'd be like, but why can't we do that? You know, and so, you know, because their world, they were, you know, the, the, there was that sort of the, the balance. And, and so it's kind of the, the biggest challenge was juggling what they felt was acceptable yeah. outside of the world that we were creating, but then also kind of ensuring that it was kind of wholesome towards the brand of the show. You know, and so just that was a constant juggle. I think we had a number of things that kind of created, um, uh, you know, created kind of hurdles for us, which fortunately we, we, we overcame. But that was definitely the biggest thing was working with uh, people that were used to not this, this, they weren't used to this landscape 
and then reframing the way they saw uh, the opportunity. In terms of the series, how much did you collaborate with them and Milkshake to actually end up with the finished product that we see on air? Um, well, with them, I suppose, in production, there was a lot of collaboration because we needed their input to kind of ensure that we were getting them to do things that wouldn't be too far away from so what they may true. do as a family. It was as true as possible. But then with, we, with, with Milkshake, we were rigorously developing th stuff prior to even getting out in the field. So there was a long process of, you know, kind of back and forthing with scripts and ideas. Um, had a fantastic showrunner, uh, which some of you may know, Paul Shuttleworth, who was just yeah. so kind of across everything and just, you know, kind of made sure that we were always bringing it back to center with kind of formatted beats and, and hitting points that, that made sense for the show. Yeah, I think, um, and then, but then the biggest challenge obviously was we were producing a show, the first series we produced it throughout lockdown. Yeah. You know, so the, the that challenge, whole world. that was a whole new world. Sorry, I know we've got to crack on. Yeah. Um, it, the whole new world. So it was shooting through windows, making sure gallery was in like a production vehicle. There was a lot of things that we did. Unfortunately, it was a green show, so we could bring it externally. Yeah. You know, we could yeah, do yeah, things outside. externally. Um, and, then for, and then dad of the family was also quite a competent shooter, did some stuff for us into, inside the house. Oh. So there was kind of, you know, there was approaches, but lockdown during the period of the first season was uh, the, the kind of biggest challenge. And, and lastly from me, <gasps> as a yes. newbie, as yeah. you call yourself, <laughs> mm -hmm. what tips would you give to people in the room that have never worked with a broadcaster, in the genre? I'll do it very quickly, because uh, I did write <laughs> some, we spoke about this. I suppose for me, um, first thing would be to interrogate your idea before you even take it out. Mm -hmm. Test it on people that are going to be the audience that you're, you're talking to. Uh, you know, and that allows you to flesh it out. And I suppose we do that with everything. Um, really kind of think about the central premise and how that speaks to not only the audience, but as you say, the broadcaster and the people that you're working with. Uh, knowing your audience, I think you've spoken about that extensively and, and that I think is paramount really to, um, no pun intended, I think it's kind of, <laughs> like you know, it, it, it is kind of just really knowing who you're speaking to and who you're selling to, not just on the commissioning side, but the wider audience. Um, Hire and engage with great talent. You know, I think I, I think I was, you know, because I was new, I had to, to kind of find people that could really assist the process and, you know, not, not allowing the ego to get in the way or not allowing any sort of thoughts to e evade what you know from elsewhere yeah. and just coming to it with a blank canvas. I think that's hiring and engaging with the right kind of people at all levels, be it the experts off screen or the talent off screen that's gonna help you execute the idea. Um, and something that I sh say through all our work is aspire to make a difference. You know, really like interrogate the idea from a point of view that how is this going to change the, the audience's perception on what it is that they're consuming? Like really, how is it going to do that? You know, so that, that's something that's important to me. Um, yeah. And any... Top tips from you, sorry. Yes. Andy. Before we go, think about your questions, everybody. Um, I would say don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, we not we're not scary. We really genuinely believe in the industry and love what we do. We want your ideas to succeed. So if you are sat there in a pitch, even just ask what would work for us. Does that sound like the type of thing that we could um, you know work with and and work with you on developing up? Um, I'd also just say know your idea inside out. Don't overcomplicate your pitch. You can follow up at the end with the detail, but in the pitch, keep it top line. Have your PowerPoint presentation. Don't do huge chunks of information. Um, keep it bullet points around the character traits. You can fill all that detail in later, but people just want to quickly have a reference point when they are reading your script, and the script is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Nailing that creative, telling those stories is the biggest thing for us. Um, so I, I, I would just say keep it brief in the in the pitch, the detail, but enough that it will stay with them, and don't chase too soon for feedback because we're really <laughs> trying hard. <laughs> and deadlines are never ending on current productions, and the pitches never end. So do be patient with us; we will get back to you. But if you're following up a week after, you are going to get an eye roll. I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. So, over to you guys. Have we got any questions that you'd like to ask? Please put your hands up. Oh, there's one over there. Would you mind speaking into the mic? We probably would hear you 
if uh, you didn't use the mic, please, for the recording. Yep, got you. We can, oh, thank you. Hi. hi. Um, yes, uh, G. Day Johnson, animation producer here. I Just met you in Mojo's, didn't I? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, let's not get started about that. <laughs> what happens in Mojo stays in Mojo's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. Right. Um, yeah, quick question just around um, what, what are your thoughts? Uh, just like how enthusiastic are you to get content around sort of the more innovative um, parts of sort of like animation and content? So stuff, all stuff pertaining to things like VR and AR and, um, you know, obviously like we've got the whole kind of like web 3.0 space opening up. I know we're talking about preschoolers, but what, um, I guess, what are the sort of like interest and the, the the general demand in the industry right now when it comes to utilizing those forms of technology in um, in these shows in particular? Great question. Mm. Yeah, um, I'll take it then, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, I'm just saying great question. You, take <laughs> you are coming like a fox. Um, I would just say those are great things to think about. However, if your idea, and it's about that tick box again, doesn't naturally lend itself to them, don't shoehorn it into them simply to say, oh, it's got a VR angle, or, you know, it is this, it is that. In preschool, the idea and the characters are the, are the key. Um, if those things can spin off outside of it, great. If you've got an idea for a theme park, amazing. Um, but equally, at the very beginning, people, if they don't love your ideas, if they don't love your characters, if they don't want to immerse themselves in the world you've built, all of that's pointless. Um, so nailing that at the very top is really important. I think a great example is obviously when they created Peppa Pig, they didn't think even really about CP. Her eyes were on the same side of her head. They had a nightmare creating the CP around it. But because people loved her so much, <laughs> it naturally went into, pre in, into CP and then they had to work with it. Um, she now obviously has her own theme park. Again, that wasn't part of the original um, idea and you can interact with her probably in every single way possible now. Um, so as much as they're great, and I would often, if you are going to present, on the last page, have a you know few further ideas of how you would push it out, but nailing the creative is the most important thing to start with. Good answer? Nothing to add. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any other questions, please? Yes, sir. Oh. What happens if, um, say, for example, you had two pitches that were kind of really super similar and you went for one and, and helped that body, you know, develop that. Um, what would happen if the other person then saw that on the screen? You know, do you, what do you do to protect, like, people's own IP, you know, that they're working on and pitching to you and at the same time protecting yourselves against, um, you know, lawsuits or whatever? Um, I think that comes back to where I said about if you come in at early doors and say, I've got a show about X. We can instantly say, no, we've got something like that. Um, obviously, there are so many ideas out there at the moment that if you've got a show about farming, so have probably about another 12 people. Um, and it's making your idea so unique that it isn't like anything else. Um, you know, I think that we do have an open door policy. We do look at everything. And that comes with its own level of, or you are often, in our feedback, we will often tell you, we're not going forward with this because it's too similar to this, or we know there's another another show in the space. You know, obviously, um, CBeebies recently um, have announced the um, Spin Master show about the vet. We have also announced a show about a vet, Hex Vet, um, <laughs> that's currently being produced by um, Blue Zoo for us with our team from the US exec in it. There are always going to be similarities. Um, I think you'd have to push it to really see copyright infringements. Um, and, you know, the, the whole case with Ed Sheeran around the music, mm -hmm. there are only certain parameters to play in and so things will sell close to it but it's making sure that your idea is so unique that your idea is the one people progress with and pass on the other one because of your um, IP. Mm. Good answer, thank you. Any other questions? No. Last chance, going, going, going. Oh. Right, well before you all get up, thank you to both thank of you. Them. That's Yay. been <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
hopefully um, you've all been able to take away some top tips. Um, I just wanted to say that The Art Of is a series um, of mini masterclasses, and we've been doing them now for the CMC for five years, so there are lots of them available on the CMC website, so please, please do go and have a look at them there. They all have the top tips and very good ideas to share, so that's that. And then I just need to say thank you again to Boom Kids for their sponsorship of this session. This is the last one in the room today. Um, we'll all be back together for the last word in the main stage at 3.30, so please do join us then. And that's when MC Grammar, for those of you who know him, I do, he's fantastic. Um, so please don't miss out on that. And in the meantime, there's tea and coffee available in the foyer, and that is sponsored by Screen Skills. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you to Michelle and Alison for looking after us. Oh, you're welcome.